Another important subject among upper respiratory tract infections is that of sinusitis. And we can define acute sinusitis as an inflammation of the mucosa of the paranasal sinuses of less than four weeks duration. The main problem in sinusitis is obstruction of the ostea of the paranasal sinuses. And of course, that can be caused by malfunction of the ciliary apparatus that lines all the sinuses in the mucosa. The other thing in evaluating a person with sinusitis or possible bacterial sinusitis is the character of the sinus secretions. If they are too thick normally, they can block the ostea. So we need to discuss the systemic factors that cause blockage of the ostea of the sinuses. And these include most commonly viral upper respiratory tract infection, a common cold, for instance, or allergy. These are the two most common reasons. Then patients can be born with a problem, uh, uh, very mucoid secretion, secretions like cystic fibrosis, and the mucus of the sinuses and the entire respiratory tract is supposed to be of a certain viscosity so that the cilia within it can beat. This, the cilia beat within this mucus lining, and if, the, if it's too viscid, they will not beat normally. Or if people, for example, are smoking, they will not beat normally. There are a variety of immune disorders which affect ciliary action. And there, there's this rather curious entity called ciliary dyskinesia the most important manifestation of which is Cartagener syndrome. Cartagener syndrome is the constellation of sinusitis, situs inversus, and bronchiectasis. These patients have all three of those findings. And if, particularly in somebody with Cartagener syndrome, the heart is on the right side of the chest, not the left. Wouldn't it be embarrassing to not recognize that? So if somebody has ciliary dyskinesia, make sure you pick out the right side for, for the heart exam. And then as I mentioned, tobacco smoke, and it's, it's interesting, you may know several people who smoke and who are always complaining of having sinus problems. Then, of course, there can be some local insults to the face that cause obstruction of the ostea of the sinuses, and they can result in bacterial sinusitis, like facial trauma, for example, prize fighters. People who do a lot of swimming and diving, either for recreation or professionally, can have sinus problems. All of you who have done any swimming recognize the changes in pressure when you go underwater. Sinusitis can be a very severe and career-ending problem for high-altitude aviation maneuvers. Uh, for example, if a pilot develops some problem with the sinuses, that pilot probably shouldn't fly if he's flying one of these fighter jets because particularly on descent, uh, the, the Sinus pressures can change so dramatically they can have a sudden onset of very severe facial pain, which could result in an aircraft accident. So high altitude aviation maneuvers are very important in the military. Then there are people who chronically take decongestants or antihistamines, and actually they can become rather dependent on those such that they're ostea seem to be always blocked. And then if a patient has to come in the hospital for surgery uh, or for admission to the ICU, they may have to be intubated and put on a ventilator. That can certainly block the ostea uh, of the sinuses if they are nasally intubated. There can be mechanical obstruction of the ostea of the sinuses as 
Some people are born with coanal atresia. One of the important exams of a newborn is to make sure the, the external nares are completely patent. Some people have deviated nasal septa. This is a pretty common problem. Most, most people don't have enough deviation of their nasal septum to obstruct the sinus ostia, but this is something that has to be examined for. Nasal polyps occur. Little kids can get foreign bodies like little plastic automobiles and things like that in their nose. And then some large bullae may form in the ethmoid sinuses that can block the ostea there. So we've been talking about blockage of the sinus ostea. Well, what are the consequences of that happening? Well, if the sinus gets blocked, then you get initially an increase in sinus pressure. And of course, fluid is going to build up behind the blockage. Now, eventually, the oxygen is going to be absorbed out of the blocked sinus, and eventually there will be negative pressure in the sinus. Now, the other thing is that bacteria, nasal and nasopharyngeal bacteria, can enter the sinus during sniffing. Some people have a chronic habit of sniffing, kind of a tick. And then a lot of people, when they have, for example, a common cold, uh, will blow their nose very hard. Some of them sound like a foghorn when they blow their nose. Well, they may actually get sinusitis from doing that. So if you have a common cold, and if you are advising your patients, you should tell them to blow their nose gently never blow their nose very hard. So the bottom line is that fluid becomes static inside of a blocked sinus, and if there are bugs there, then the bugs can, as we say, set up light housekeeping uh, in the sinus. And if the ciliary apparatus doesn't work properly, that can also complicate problems. Uh, a typical viral infection can actually eliminate some of the cilia. They'll come back, but during a viral infection, sometimes the cilia are destroyed. And as I mentioned, if the mucus layer is abnormal, the ciliary action is abnormal. It's, you don't think of this often, but your, the, your sinuses are not supposed to be dry. There's supposed to be mucus every day, all day, in your sinuses. And that keeps the cilia moving as they are supposed to move. And they normally beat toward the posterior pharynx. And the secretions are normally swallowed. Patients who smoke cigarettes have a change in the viscosity of that mucus. And I think you can imagine how that may mess up the motility of the cilia. So no wonder they have sinus congestion and no wonder they have frequent episodes of sinusitis. The microbiology of sinusitis actually reflects the upper respiratory tract flora. So you shouldn't be surprised that Streptococcus pneumoniae is the most common cause of bacterial sinusitis, followed close behind by Haemophilus influenzae. Uh, anaerobes are not a real common cause of sinusitis unless the patient has uh, chronic blockage of the ostea. That's when anaerobes uh, can uh, survive there. Streptococcus species don't cause acute sinusitis very often. Moraxella cateralis has a low incidence in adults, but a much higher incidence in children. And miscellaneous pathogens and Staph aureus account for the rest. So acute sinusitis is common, but it's most commonly caused by viruses. And I just want to point out that children and those 
Adults who have small children know this very well. Children get the common cold five to seven times each year, and so do their parents. Now, adults who don't have small children will get two to three colds a year. You probably can document on your own, that on your own experience. I want to point out, however, how uncommon complicating bacterial sinusitis is. Only 6 to 13 percent of kids get bacterial sinusitis, even though they get five to seven common colds a year. So that's pretty unusual. And adults get bacterial sinusitis from 0.2 to 2.5 percent of the time. So most of the time when a, an adult comes into the office complaining of nasal congestion and having purulent nasal secretions, they still have the common cold. They don't have bacterial sinusitis. And it's overdiagnosed and it certainly is overtreated with antibiotics. So, in a viral upper respiratory tract infection, it starts out, as everybody knows, clear and watery. And it then becomes thick and mucoid. And even in viral sinusitis, viral common colds, it becomes greenish and yellowish. All that means is that neutrophils have come into the secretions and made the color yellow or green. Low-grade fever is not common in adults, but it is fairly common in children. And the common cold, and we should all advise our patients of this, the common cold lasts normally five to 10 days. So the patients are likely to come into the doctor in the second week of the illness saying, I'm not well, I've got bacterial sinusitis, doc, I want some antibiotics. But they still have the residual of a common cold, most of them, not bacterial sinusitis. We start thinking about bacterial sinusitis if they've had more than 10 days of nasal discharge, if they have low-grade fever, if they have malodorous breath, which reflects the possibility of anaerobic contamination. And we certainly worry about it if they have periorbital edema, because that usually means a bacterial sinusitis. Viruses don't do that. We also think about it if their symptoms were getting better from their common cold, but now they're starting to have increased discharge and congestion. So they were starting to ease off and then they turn around and start going the other way, or if they develop new fever, or if they start developing a cough in the daytime. So one of the things that is most important to an evaluating physician is how long the respiratory symptoms have been there. That's the most useful factor for diagnosing bacterial infection. Symptoms are signs lasting more than 10 days without clinical improvement of any kind. That's when we think about bacterial sinusitis. Certainly if they have purulent nasal discharge and high fever for three to four days, because high fever isn't common in viral pharyngi or viral sinusitis. Or let's say they have new fever, headache, or increased discharge after five to six days of a typical viral syndrome. And by the way, the headache is generally located anteriorly where the sinuses are, and particularly aggravated by leaning forward. Uh, those are indications of a possible bacterial sinusitis. So if a patient has what we call double sickening, we would begin to think about bacterial superinfection. What about imaging in acute sinusitis? This is overused as well. On an uncomplicated bacterial sinusitis, you don't need to image the sinuses. 
if you were to image somebody with a common cold, and it's done far too frequently, you would find sinus thickening. You might even find air fluid levels in the sinuses of somebody who has nothing more than the common cold. The imaging generally can't confirm a diagnosis of bacterial sinusitis. Just one aside is that if somebody had fungal sinusitis, you may show invasion of the bones. That would be a serious problem, but generally imaging uh, is not indicated in acute sinusitis.